every time we have a function with the society, always in the middle of a snowstorm, and now we've got all this rain all of a sudden, or second spring, and forget what we thought. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, make a few announcements. I think you're all aware that we are selling memberships outside the front for the Historical Society, <coughs> if anyone's interested. We're also selling the videotapes from the uh, previous four lectures. They're, they're turning out very well, I must say. So if you've missed them, you can buy them if you want to check out what we've been doing this last year. And now, without further delay, a few brief words about our guest lecturer today. Uh, Dr. Rosa received his degree, his PhD, from Stanford University in California in 1971. He is now history professor at the University of Toronto. He has published and still publishes many papers in Europe, Eastern Europe, United States, on Macedonia, Slavic studies as well. He's an expert in Macedonia. He's an expert of Macedonian history. And we're very pleased and honored today to have Dr. Rosa the German world in the West and the Russian world in the East. 
all of whom at the beginning of the 19th century found themselves under foreign rule. They were either under Austrian, German, Russian, or Ottoman rule. During the first half of the 19th century, or the first quarter of the 19th century, all of them went through a period of national awakening, which was followed by a process of nation building and nation formation, which eventually, in most cases, culminated in a struggle for national independence or self-rule, and eventually in independent statehood. Now, the Macedonians, or the Macedonian people, went through a similar experience. That is, they experienced national awakening and nationalism just like the other peoples of Eastern Europe or in Central Europe. But no other nationalism has been surrounded with as much controversy, no other nationalism gave rise to greater controversy than Macedonian nationalism. The reasons for this controversy to me are very simple. They were not, the controversy was not created by the Macedonians. It was created primarily by the neighbors of the Macedonians, the Bulgarians, the Greeks, and the Serbians, who experienced nationalism a little bit before the Macedonians, earlier. And by the time the Macedonians began going through the process of national awakening, the, the neighbors of Macedonia, Serbian, Greek, and Bulgarian nationalism, were already engaged in the competition for Macedonia. And in order to justify their claims on Macedonia territorially and ethnically, they had to or chose to deny the existence of a Macedonian people. The existence, and if there was no Macedonian people, how can you have a Macedonian national awakening? How can you have a Macedonian nationalism? <coughs> In spite of these denials, though, there was a Macedonian people, and there was such a thing as a Macedonian national awakening, and eventually Macedonian nationalism. <clears throat> in most respects, and in reality, Mes the Macedonian national or Macedonian nationalism went through a development that was very, very similar to that of the neighboring Balkan nationalisms. Uh, and in most cases, it was identical with the national development of the so-called, what historians call, the young and small peoples of East Central Europe. <coughs> of course, there were some peculiarities in the Macedonian development. Uh, the most important of which were its delay in its emergence belated development, one. And secondly, at times in the development of Macedonian nationalism, there appeared some contradictory trends and tendencies, uh, which were more pronounced than in some of the other nationalism in Central Europe. But both the belated development of Macedonian nationalism uh, and some of these contradictory tendencies with which I'll deal a little bit later on were really the, the result or the byproduct of the very difficult environment in which Macedonian nationalism was forced to grow and develop. Indeed, I cannot think of any other national movement in this Central Europe, and I have studied virtually all of them, who was forced to grow and develop in as unfavorable circumstances as was the case of Macedonian nationalism or of the development of Macedonian nationalism. But to turn briefly to the setting in which Macedonian nationalism grew and developed. Now, in the case of all national movements, there was opposition. All national movements, whether we are dealing with the Czech national movement, Polish national movement, Serbian national movement, Greek national movement, Bulgarian national movement, they all had opponents. That is, there were other forces that opposed or denied the legitimacy of a particular national movement. 
And in most cases, there was one opponent or maybe two at the most. In Macedonia's case, there were at least four. First, there was the Ottoman state, which uh, controlled the whole territory of Macedonia. So, Macedonian nationalism, in order to develop, had to fight against the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire fought back. But in addition to the Ottoman Empire, there were other opponents of Macedonian nationalism. First of all, and, and, and in the long run, they probably proved much more powerful and much more detrimental to the development of Macedonian nationalism than the Turkish Empire. And those were Bulgarian nationalism, Greek nationalism, and Serbian nationalism. There were some others, Romania, but there was kind of indirect involvement and did not play a very important role in the development of Macedonian nationalism. And Albania, and that comes, the Albanians come into the picture much later. But Bulgarian, Serbian, and Greek nationalism, which represented the three claimants to Macedonia, played even more, more of a negative role in the development of Macedonian nationalism than the Ottoman Empire. So, in addition to the fact that Macedonian nationalism had to contend with four determined opponents, there were some other unfavorable circumstances that Macedonian nationalism had to confront. Now, the Ottoman Empire was a theocratic state. That is, it was a state that was based on religion rather than on nationality or ethnicity. The Ottoman Empire recognized churches, established churches and religions. It didn't recognize ethnic groups or nationalities. So it was important for every ethnic group in, in the Ottoman Empire, or every national group, to have a church. Because the church as a recognized, or a church as a recognized, a recognized institution in the Ottoman Empire, had virtually total control over the community that it represented. For example, until uh, the establishment of the Bulgarian church in 1870, there was only one church for, the, for all the Orthodox peoples of the Ottoman Empire, and that was the Patriarchate, or the Greek-controlled church in Constantinople. And as a recognized institution of the Ottoman Empire, it had the right to establish schools, to control the churches, uh, to collect taxes from all the Orthodox subjects, and so on. So to have a church uh, was a, of tremendous advantage in the Ottoman Empire, and that's why the Greeks benefited throughout the century. As long as the Greeks controlled the Patriarchate of Constantinople, they really controlled the Orthodox community in the Ottoman Empire. By the third quarter of the 19th century, well, the Greeks had their church, that is the Patriarchate of Constantinople, which had been recognized by the Ottoman Turks virtually since the conquest of Constantinople in the <coughs> The Serbians also had a church of their own. It wasn't a patriarchal church in the Ottoman Empire, but there was a Serbian metropolitan. And in 1870, with the help of Russian diplomacy, uh, the Ottoman Empire agreed to the establishment of the Bulgarian Exarchate, which was a Bulgarian church in the Ottoman Empire. So the three nationalisms that opposed Macedonian nationalism, Bulgarian, Greek, and Serbian nationalism, all three of them had their own churches in the Ottoman Empire. And those churches had the right, legally, to establish churches, to build churches, to establish schools, to have community organizations, uh, to collect taxes, to control the economic, political, cultural life of all those parishioners who attended their churches. The Macedonians did not have a church. There were attempts made to establish a Macedonian church, but those attempts failed. failed. As a result of that, throughout Ottoman history, up to the partitions or to the disappearance of the Ottoman Empire, 
while the Greeks, Serbians, and Bulgarians were free to establish their institutions on Macedonian territory with the permission of the Ottoman government. Legally, the Macedonians had absolutely no institutions of their own, and they could not have any because they didn't have their own church. So keep this in mind in any discussion of Macedonian nationalism or in development. Now, what was even more important was the fact that the three different churches, the three different communities competing with each other in Macedonia, as I have already said, denied the existence of Macedonia and claimed the Macedonians as their own, as belonging to their nation and to their nation state. That is, the Bulgarians claimed that the Macedonians were Bulgarians, the Serbs claimed that the Macedonians were Serbians, and the Greeks claimed that the Macedonians were, well, they couldn't say Greek because the languages were so far apart, so they decided that the Macedonians were Slavophone Greeks. That's a contradiction in terms, but in history, we find contradictions sometimes. Now, all three nationalisms, the Greek, Serbian, and Bulgarian, virtually from the very beginning of, the Mas of Macedonian nationalism, carried on a determined struggle against each other in Macedonia. At the beginning, this struggle was carried out by textbooks up to about the middle of the 19th century or up through the 1860s. There was competition of textbooks. You know, the Serbians were trying to bring Serbian textbooks to Bulgaria. Bulgaria had, did not exist as yet as an independent state, but the Bulgarian movement was already advanced and developed. There were Bulgarian publishing houses, so they were trying to bring their own books into Macedonia, and the Greeks, through the Patriarch's Church, was doing the same thing with Greek books, Greek, Greek book schools, and so on. By the 1860s, this struggle for Macedonia on the part of the three neighboring nationalism started becoming politicized. Uh, so what was a struggle uh, of textbooks by the 1860s became struggle of three different nationalisms. And then the struggle became even more intense after the establishment of the separate Bulgarian church, the so-called Bulgarian Exarchate in 1870. From 1870 on, you have a virtual state of war between Greek nationalism, Bulgarian nationalism, and Serbian nationalism for the hearts and minds of the Macedonian people. This contest was carried out through schools, churches, businesses, and so on. Uh, at the beginning, or at least up to about the 1890s, the struggle was a struggle of propaganda carried out by the three churches in Macedonia. These churches were supported by nationalist organizations established by the Bulgarian, Greek, and Serbian governments. Uh, the Greek institution organization was called Ethnikia Teria, or National Society. The Serbian institution was called uh, Society of Sveti Sava, and so on. So there were the churches doing the work in Macedonia. They were supported by institutions or organizations, Greek, Serbian, and Bulgarian. And behind these organizations and the churches stood the governments of the Principality of Bulgaria, the Kingdom of Greece, and the Kingdom of Serbia, pouring all their wealth or putting out the disposal of their churches, everything they had, in order to win the struggle for Macedonia. After the 1890s, the situation became even worse because what until then was struggle of propagandas by the 1890s became struggle of armed bands. And this struggle continued until the partition of Macedonia in 1913. That is, the churches, these nationalist societies, the governments of the neighboring countries sponsored armed bands. They were sent to Macedonia to fight each other. <coughs> Bulgarian bands fighting Serbian bands, fighting Greek bands, and so on. 
The struggle became especially bloody after the suppression of the Linden uprising of 1903, and then culminated with the partitions of Macedonia uh, after the Second Balkan War. Now, the aim of this struggle, as I've already said, was to win through every means possible books, schools, churches, armed bands, whatever, the hearts and minds of the Macedonian people to the Bulgarian, Serbian, or Greek side. Or if this could not be done, then to force the Macedonian population into submission, to accept Bulgarian, Serbian, or Greek nationalism, rule, or authority. The final aim, though, was from the very beginning, control of Macedonia. Throughout the period up to the partition or to 1909-1912, the aim of Bulgaria was the annexation of the whole of Macedonia to Bulgaria. Uh, earlier on in the 1880s, 1870s, 1880s, up to about 1890, Serbian and Greek nationalism were also thinking in terms of annexing the whole of Macedonia. By the 1890s, though, they came to the conclusion that that would be impossible. So they began to think in terms of partitioning Macedonia. That is, while Bulgaria uh, claimed the whole of Macedonian territory, Greece and Serbia would have been satisfied with an agreement to divide Macedonia among them. And this struggle for Macedonia, which, as I said, began already in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s, culminated with the partition of Macedonia uh, in 1913, at the end of the Second Balkan War, or the so-called Inter-Allied War, which was fought by Allied Greece and Serbia on the one hand, and Bulgaria on the other. As a result of the partition, uh, Aegean Macedonia, or what we know as Aegean Macedonia, came under Greek control, Barter Macedonia under Serbian, and eventually under Yugoslav control, uh, and the smallest part here in Macedonia under Bulgarian control. The partition of 1913 was reaffirmed uh, at the end of the First World War by the peace treaty ending the First World War and has in remained in effect to the present day with few minor alterations made at the end of the First and the Second World War. The partition of Macedonia did not mean any kind of improvement. Indeed, it represented a worsening of conditions as far as development of Macedonian nationalism was concerned. Because under the Ottoman Empire, the system was sufficiently corrupt that even in this vicious competition for Macedonia, there was some leeway for the Macedonians. In some cases, they could play one against the other. There is documentary evidence, for example, that a Macedonian family would shift their children from Bulgarian schools to a Serbian or Greek school because the Serbian or Greek propaganda institutions paid a bribe. So they were able to play one against the other. Now, once Macedonia was divided, and after the new rulers consolidated their position in their respective parts of Macedonia, Aegean, Vardar, and Tyrion, then the situation became much worse. Because there, there was no room for bargaining. It was either Greek authority and control or nothing, Serbian authority or control in the Serbian part, or Bulgarian authority and control in the Bulgarian part. And both the Greek and the Serbian government, immediately, especially after they consolidated their position within their uh, territory, Macedonian territory, they embarked on policies the aim of which was to destroy any and all signs of Macedonian particularism, patriotism, or nationalism. And these policies continued throughout the interwar period. The situation in Bulgaria was slightly different. Um, the Bulgarians did not make Macedonian names the name itself, for example, uh, illegal. The term Macedonia could be used and was used during the period between the two world wars. 
uh, there was a Macedonian community, there were Macedonian activists. The attitude of Bulgaria was much more, not so much persecution as was the case in Serbia, uh, Yugoslavia, and Greece. Uh, it was not so much persecution as, as it was kind of patronizing. They said, well, you are our little brothers, we allow you to, deal, to do all these things. Uh, in any case, the aim of all three governments throughout the interwar period was to, as I've said, to destroy any sign of Macedonian particularism, patriotism, and nationalism, uh, and to bring about the total assimilation of the Macedonian population in the three parts of Macedonia. Now, what all this meant, and I uh, intentionally devoted so much attention to the environment in which Macedonian nationalism was forced to function. What all this meant was that throughout the first 100, 120 years of its existence, Macedonian nationalism was illegal at home. That is, there was no legal institutional uh, basis or infrastructure on which Macedonian nationalism could develop. It had to develop, if it could develop, illegal, as an illegal movement and against overwhelming odds. Secondly, it was illegal at home and it was illegitimate internationally because it was not recognized by it. And since it was not recognized in internationally, it could not and it did not get any help or assistance from anywhere. The other national movements in the Balkans, Greek, Serbian, Bulgarian, received diplomatic, cultural support, and in the end, military help from one or another of the great powers. The Western powers in the case of Greece, Russia in the case of Bulgaria. The Macedonian movement did not receive any help from anyone. So it had to operate, it had to develop illegally, and in a status of virtual illegitimacy throughout the period from the 1830s, 1840s, until the Second World War. I cannot think again of any other national movement or nationalism that was forced to develop in such difficult conditions as Macedonian nationalism. So keep this in mind now when I turn to the actual development of Macedonian nationalism. Um, for the sake of clarity, uh, the development of Macedonian nationalism could be divided into four stages. The first, from the first steerings of uh, kind of cultural awakening in the 1820s up to 1870s to the rise of what one may call Macedonianism. That is 1870, which is also the year of the establishment of the Bulgarian Exarchate. Then the second stage from 1870 until the revolution of 1903, which represents the emergence of Macedonian national and revolutionary organizations, platforms, and ideologies. Then the third stage, a short and a tragic period between the revolution of 1903 and the partitions of Macedonia in 1913 and then the repartition during the First World War up to 1918, the end of the First World War. And then the fourth period, 1919 to 1940, which represents a resurgence of Macedonian nationalism, this time on the political left. And I'll touch briefly on the four stages, or these four stages, in the development of Macedonian nationalism. You can see my back, was it 10 to 3? No. And what time did I start? No, 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 I don't want to say. 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 
than you. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. So the first stage, 1820s to 1870s, uh, really cannot as yet, or at least the first period, cannot as yet work. During this period, there is no dominant tendency in terms of consciousness on the part of the Macedonian population. Uh, the first stage of this period, the, the, the basically the second quarter of the 19th century, represents a Slav awakening in Macedonia. And as part of this Slav awakening, there is a strong reaction against the total control of Macedonia or over the life of the Macedonian people, exercised until then by the Greek-controlled Patriarchist Church of Constantinople. So it, it's, it's better to call it a Slav kind of awakening rather than a Macedonian awakening. And this is the period that we normally associate with the first generation of Macedonian awakeners, such as Jordan and Konstantin of Gino, the brothers uh, Milatinov, Konstantin and Dimitar, uh, Prelichev, Genzifo, and so on. The majority is, again, it's very difficult during the, during the third or the second quarter of the 19th century to come up with a consciousness or a name that the Macedonian people identify themselves with. They identify themselves during this period with a mixture of names. Uh, in addition to the regional identification, such as Pitochani or Prilepchani or Kostochani or Larinchani or whatever, uh, they use the Slav name most frequently. They still use Orthodox Pravoslav, and if somebody asks him now, what are you, he can say, I'm Slav, or I'm Pravoslavian, or I'm Pito Channel, the original, and so on. In addition to that, they use the names of some of their neighbors. Uh, until then, the most widely used name was the Greek one. Frequently, they identified themselves as Greeks until this period meaning they belong to the Orthodox Church, because the, the name Orthodox and Greek was used almost interchangeably. Uh, in the areas closer to Serbia, some people refer to themselves as Serbs. Of the names of neighbors, the one that was most widely used was the Bulgarian name, partly because the Greeks called them the Slav Bulgarian, partly because the Bulgarian name survived through the monasteries in Macedonia, which for a long time, and churches, which for a long time had been under the control of the Bulgarians in the Middle Ages, or under the control of the Bulgarian church. So as Misirkov, the ideologue of Macedonian nationalism later on, around the turn of the 20th century, uh, commented, the Bulgarian name was um, a relic from the medieval past. Uh, but some Macedonians also used the, the Bulgarian name because really they felt they were Bulgarian. They had not as yet come in contact with the real Bulgarian, with what they, uh, so they called themselves Bulgarian. Once they came in contact with the real Bulgarian, you see, then they began to differentiate from them. Until then, they called the real Bulgarians, they called them Shopi. They called themselves Bulgarian, and they called the real Bulgarian Shopi or Gormi Bulgarian. <coughs> In any case, almost all of these names were not names that the Macedonians developed for themselves. These were names that were given to them by others. You call, when you deal with an illiterate population, tell them you're Bulgarian, they say, okay, I'm Bulgarian. Tell them you're Serbian, they say, okay, I'm Serbian. So these were names that were given to the Macedonian population by others. Now, a greater kind of differentiation between the Macedonians and the others developed 
in the second phase of the first stage, that is in the 1860s, when the competition for Macedonia increased or intensified and the Macedonians were forced to come into closer contact with their neighbors for the first time, with Bulgarians, Serbs, and so on. And for the first time, and the competition for Macedonia had already begun, and a section of the Macedonian intelligentsia, sort of educated Macedonian, began to think of themselves, for the first time to consider what are we, now that they became acquainted with the real Serbians, real Bulgarians, and they were acquainted with Greeks and so on. Not only they started to differentiate themselves from the others, but they also began to think in terms of their interests, the interests of the population of Macedonia, the interests of Macedonia as a, as a region, and so on. And this begins the differentiation with the others. And it's this section of the intelligence that in the 1860s, to distinguish itself from the Serbs, from Bulgarians, from others, officially, in effect, adopted the name Macedonia, the name of their land, land as a national name and symbol. They started calling themselves Macedonians as distinguished from the others. And they also claim that they are the purest and the oldest of the Slavs, and that they are the direct descendants of uh, the ancient Macedonians, Alexander, Philip, and so on, even though there was a contradiction in this claim. They could not be Slavs uh, and direct descendants of the ancient Macedonians at the same time. But that, in the age of romantic nationalism, didn't make any difference. All nationalities used romantic notions to develop pride in themselves. This movement, or the adoption of the Macedonian intelligentsia, of the name Macedon, of the land, as a national name and symbol, uh, was noticed by the Bulgarians. They condemned what in Bulgaria, the Bulgarian press at the time became known as Macedonism, and the so-called Macedonisti, the carriers of this ideology. Uh, they accused them of being separatists from the Bulgarian nation. It's not a question of separatism. Macedonianism was a natural reaction on the part of the Macedonian population that was thinking in terms of its own interests and the interests of their land. But the emergence of this ideology of Macedonianism marks the development of two different separate conceptions, national conceptions, among the Slavic population of the Ottoman Empire, which by then was primarily Bulgarian and Macedonian. And the struggle between Bulgarianism and Macedonianism in the 1860s is of critical importance. But I said it it represents this division between the two people who until then were fighting together against the dominant influence of the Greek church and of Greek culture both in Macedonia and Bulgaria. <coughs> the second stage in the development of Macedonian nationalism is the period 1870, which begins with the establishment of a separate Bulgarian church, the Exarchate, and goes on to the revolution, to the uh, ill-fated revolution of 1903, the Linden Revolution. And during this period, for the first time, Macedonian national and revolutionary organizations were organized, and Macedonian political programs, platforms, and ideologies developed. Now, keep in mind, under the difficult conditions which I described at the beginning. This is the period of the most intense struggle between Greek nationalism, Serbian nationalism, and Bulgarian nationalism for control of Macedonia. And it is more intense than before because by now there is a separate Greek and Bulgarian, in addition to Serbian church, and by 1878 there is a Bulgarian state which did not exist before, in addition to the Greek and the Serbian state. Now, looking at it objectively, from a Macedonian point of view, the situation in the 1870s, or from the point of view of a Macedonian member of the Macedonian intelligentsia, the situation looked completely hopeless. 
three much more developed nationalisms are competing for Macedonia. They control all the educational facilities. They control the churches. Macedonian children, if they want, if they could get education, they had to attend either Greek, Bulgarian, or Serbian schools. Uh, once they, and they, they could attend, those schools were established by the propagandists in Macedonia itself. And the most promising students or pupils, once they finished public school in their, in their towns or nearest towns, then they were taken at government expense to study either in Athens, Sofia, or Belgium. And they were given the best possible education. The aim of this generosity on the part of the pretender, the government's pretending over Macedonia, was to assimilate this promising Macedonian student and then to send them back to Macedonia as agents of Bulgarian interests, Greek interests, or Serbian interests. In many cases, or in some cases, the propaganda succeeded. Uh, a section of this educated, young, educated Macedonian intelligentsia accepted the education provided virtually freely by the host benefactor country, whether Greece, Bulgaria, or Serbia. Uh, they were virtually assimilated into what they considered to be a higher, more developed culture than the peasant culture of Macedonia. It's Greek, Serbian, or Bulgarian. They were uh, introduced to a different world in Athens, Sofia, and Belgrade than there was in the provincial towns of Macedonia. So in effect, they were assimilated into the new culture and for all practical purposes were lost to Macedonia. And they embarked on the road to what I would call philism, both Bulgarophilism, Serbophilism, or Grecophilism, or as you might call them, both Bulgaromanstvo, Serbomanstvo, or Grecomanstvo. I use a more polite term. But basically, they embarked on the road of philism, that if they accepted the Greek uh, point of view or the Bulgarian or Serbian point of view, and then really they made no contribution to the development of Macedonianism, Macedonian nationalism, and so on. The rest, and I think, although I haven't done any quantitative studies, the majority of the graduates of these schools did not accept the road of philism. That is, something Macedonia remained in their heads, in their hearts. And over a period of time, they assumed the leading position in Macedonian national and revolutionary movements and organizations. That is, even though they were trained in the schools of the propagandists, they decided that to them it was more important to defend the interests of Macedonia and of their people, whom they continued to define as Macedonia. Now, in the period after 1870, two major tendencies emerged uh, in this, what I would call, Macedonian national development or in Macedonian nationalism. One, I would call Macedonian Bulgarianism, and the other, Macedonianism or Macedonism. And a few brief comments on these two tendencies. Macedonian Bulgarianism represented at the beginning an attempt on the part of a section of the Macedonian intelligentsia to reach a compromise with the much more developed Bulgarian national movement. That is, they in effect approached Bulgarians or Bulgarian leaders and said, why don't we create a common language and so on. Now obviously they wanted the basis of that common language to be the dialects of Macedonia, and this was not acceptable to the Bulgarian national movement. They argued that since Cyril and Methodius came from Macedonia, the Macedonian dialects are purer. But in any case, as I said, Bulgarian nationalism by the 1870s was so confident that it didn't pay any attention to these Macedonians who were interested in some kind of a compromise with Bulgarian nationalism. And Bulgarian nationalism also rejected some other overtures they made. In the end, 
the Macedonian, this section of the Macedonian intelligentsia compromised partially. They realized that Macedonian, the Macedonian movement was weak, that it could not fight Hellenism or Greek influence by itself. So, as I said, they compromised and they made certain concessions to the Bulgarians or to Bulgarianism in order to have Bulgarian support in the struggle against the Greeks. They accepted, in effect, the Bulgarian language as a common language. They accepted the authority of the Bulgarian church. But for, in any other respect, in every other respect, they declared the Macedonians to be different. And they rose in defense of what they considered to be Macedonian interests political, economic, social, cultural, and so on. Many groups, individuals, and groups, and organizations of this sort, that is, who believe that somehow Macedonian, the Macedonian language, or Macedonians have a common language with the Bulgarians, but otherwise are politically different. Culturally, they're the same, but politically they represent two different nations. There were many individuals of this sort. By the 1890s, they coalesced into a powerful popular movement, which uh, came under the leadership of the internal Macedonian revolutionary organization, or IMRO, which, as you know, was led by Gosta Del Shatavian, and, and the others. Now, the aim of the Bugaro Macedonian, as I call them, well, or their platform, they called for a, they tended to be politically on the left. Um, they called for revolutionary struggle against the Ottoman Empire, against the Turks, for the liberation of Macedonia, hence their slogan, Macedonia for the Macedonians. The struggle for the liberation of Macedonia was supposed to be carried by Macedonians primarily, and they emphasized this point all along. They were receiving some help from the Bulgarian side, but the emphasis was always Macedonia for the Macedonians, Macedonia to be liberated by the Macedonians for the Macedonians. And the instrument, the way to liberation was revolutionary struggle. The other tendency, Macedonianism or Macedonism, was much more clearly defined Macedonian nationalism in every sense. They are really the direct descendants of the Macedonisti of the 1860s. And already in the 1870s and 1880s, they declared that the Macedonians were a separate nation with their own language, their own history, their own culture. That is, unlike the Macedon of Bulgaria, who were compromising or prepared to compromise with the Bulgarians, the Macedonisti, or the Macedon representing this tendency of Macedonianism, in effect declared the Macedonians to be separate nation in every sense of the word, linguistically, culturally, politically, and so on. Unlike the revolutionary organization, they emphasized the evolutionary or gradual approach for the liberation of Macedonia. That is, they did not focus, they were not obsessed with the idea of revolution. Mainly because, unlike the revolutionary organization, they saw the greatest threat to the Macedonian people not in the Turks, but rather in the neighboring propagandists, that is, in Bulgarian, Serbian, and Greek nationalists. They were, in effect, arguing that the Macedonians should not be fighting the Turks, but rather they should try to win autonomy within the Ottoman Empire with the help of the Turks. And then, once such autonomy was established, eliminate from Macedonia all the efforts of the foreign propagandists, develop nationally, and then start thinking about political independence. Basically, what the Macedonisti were saying that the Macedonians should develop fully, free of the outside interferences, as a nation in every sense of the word, before uh, they start fighting the Ottoman Empire, before they start seeking political independence. 
if they do not do that, then the pretenders to Macedonia might do to them what they eventually did in 1913, that is partition Macedonia. The Bulgarians condemn both of these tendencies. Uh, Macedonian Bulgarianism was condemned as political separatism, and Macedonianism was condemned as national separatism. <laughs> there are some differences between the two tendencies, but really the similarities are far greater. Uh, the differences, as I have said, uh, concerned tactics more than anything else. They were both for independent Macedonia, but they differ on how that mass independence should be achieved. The Macedonisti or Macedonianism, in effect, arguing first aligned or putting forth the gradual approach with the cooperation of the Turks against the pretenders to Macedonia, while the revolutionary organization emphasized revolutionary struggle against the Turks, independent Macedonia, and eventually uh, a place for uh, Macedonia in some future Slav or Balkan Federation. Um, the membership in the two movements in many cases overlap. Uh, when, when, when we deal normally with IMRO, with the internal Macedonian revolutionary organization, we sometimes tend to think of it as a party, but it was not a party, it was a movement. And it had many factions within it. The left wing of Vomaro or IMRO, uh, which were, was represented by best known names, such as Rota Delchev and Damian Gruev and Taro Toshev and uh, and so on, the left wing was very close in its ideas to the Macedonian tendency. There was virtually no difference between the two. The right wing of Bugaro Macedonianism and of Imro was very close to the Bugaro file. Um, until the revolution of 1903, the left wing was in control of Imro. After 1903, when most of the leaders of the left of Imro disappeared, either they, they were killed during the uprising, the Linden uprising itself, or then after that, in the struggle for control of Imro, they virtually exterminated each other. But after 1903, gradually, Imro passes under the control of the right wing and moves in the direction of Bugarophilism, or Perkhovism as it's normally called, uh, until the 1920s when other changes begin to affect. Now, the two tendencies that I have singled out affected the intelligentsia, that is, the propagandas that operated in Macedonia uh, had an impact on the intelligentsia section of the intelligence was assimilated, other sections moved in the direction of Macedonian Bulgarianism or Macedonianism. The majority of the population obviously were affected, or the simple people, the 95% of the population, were obviously affected to a certain extent by the work of the propagandists, but not as much as one would think. The majority of them were illiterate, in some ways, I jokingly sometimes say that illiteracy saved the Macedonians. Uh, most of them were illiterate in the 1880s and would remain illiterate virtually until the 1830s. Those who attended schools of the propagandists, Greek, Bulgarian, or Serbian, were attended only about two or three years at the most. And two or three years of elementary education was not enough to make one expert in the Bulgarian language or in the Serbian language, let alone in the Greek language. So really, the schooling that they received in the, in the local schools and the influence that they were under in the churches was not sufficient to make them into Bulgarian, Serbians, or Greeks. So 
they were developing a consciousness of their own, in effect. A consciousness that was based on, on the speech, Macedonian speech, the dialect that they spoke, on Macedonian customs, on Macedonian folklore, on Macedonian tradition. And they identified all this with the land that they lived in, which was called Macedonia. They sometimes use the term Macedonian, Macedonians or Macedonka. They definitely use the term for the land Macedonia. <coughs> it's not, it's, it is, they were developing a Macedonian consciousness, but not the intellectual Macedonian consciousness of the intelligentsia, but rather a Macedonian consciousness that I call, or I've chosen to call, the peasant ideology of Nashism, from Nash. They, they had a clear conception of who the foreigners were and who their own people were. And they used this dichotomy, Nash, Chush. Everything that related to Macedonia was Nash, or Nashe, or Nasho. Everything that was not Macedonian was Chush. Language, custom, tradition, food, music, whatever. So even in the oppressive conditions of existing under the influence of free propaganda, the illiterate peasant Macedonian population already, by the time of the Ilinden uprising, identified itself with the land and what Macedonia and what this land represented to them. And they identified that land with Imro and other Macedonian organizations. So one could argue that already before the partitions of Macedonia, the majority of the Macedonian population had this peasant uh, Macedonian consciousness that one could call Nazism or peasant or mass Macedonianism. And in the end, it is this mass of the population that continue to feel this belonging to Macedonia and association with other Macedonians that in effect saved Macedonia and Macedonianism and the Macedonian consciousness and Macedonian action. Now, <coughs> the duality in the Macedonian movement, this parallel development within the ranks of the intelligentsia between Macedonian Bulgarianism and Macedonianism, and on the part of the masses, this Nazism or Macedonianism of the masses, this division, parallel but not exactly connected, uh, development of Macedonian nationalism obviously weakened it. It would have been Macedonian nationalism would have been stronger if all these groups were united. But under the conditions in which Macedonian nationalism grew and developed, it was not possible in any other way. The masses of the population were not in contact with the intelligentsia. In most cases, this call, uh, unification of different tendencies of the intelligentsia with mass consciousness develops through the school system or through churches, through publication of books. In Macedonia, those did not exist. So even though the emergence of these different tendencies, sometimes contradictory, sometimes competing within Macedonian nationalism, weakened the movement in the short run and in the long run, it was really an unavoidable consequence of the conditions, unfavorable conditions in which Macedonian nationalism was forced to develop. And these different tendencies will coalesce together. Macedonian Bulgarianism, Macedonianism, and the Nazism of, masses, of the masses. They'll come together, they'll coalesce into one movement, but that would happen in the 1930s. And I'll get to that in a minute. We're running out of time? No, we'll keep it back. Um, well, I'll question you soon. Um, 
stage, as I said, is probably the saddest in the development of Macedonian nationalism. It began with the suppression of the Linden Uprising of 1903, and then concluded with the partitions, three partitions, and new partitions of Macedonia in the period between 1912, 1913, and 1919. Uh, it's a period that represents a disarray within Macedonian nationalism and decline within Macedonian nationalism, partly because of the split within Imro and its movement in the toward the right and toward Bulgarophilism, partly because the leadership of the original Imro, the left wing, which represented the interests of Macedonia and the Macedonian people, was virtually decimated. As I've already said, many of them died during the revolution. Others were killed after the revolution when the struggle for control of Imro was taking place. Many of these murders engineered from the Bulgarian side and so on. Uh, in addition to that, this was the heyday of the armed struggle of the three propagandists for control of Macedonia. And as I said, <coughs> the period ends with the partition of Macedonia, which represented another kind of demoralizing setback for Macedonian nationalism. And by the time the period ended and the new period began in the early 20s, Macedonian nationalism was in disarray and going through a period of deep soul searching until it re-emerged in, in the early 1920s in all kinds of different groups, but that represents the third, the fourth, and the final stage in the development of Macedonian nationalism, and briefly on that. So each of our period is very interesting and in many ways even more creative than the second period. Uh, at the beginning, uh, the various Macedonian organizations, groups in Bulgaria and elsewhere uh, had to go through a process of soul, soul searching, as I've already said, and regrouping. Uh, they regrouped partly with the aid of uh, elements in Bulgaria, but partly with the aid of a new ally that appeared on the scene for Macedonian nationalism, and that was international communism. Uh, what is important to emphasize from the very beginning though, is that the Macedonian population did not accept the partition of its land, and did not accept the oppressive conditions under which it was forced to live in the three partitions of Macedonia, in Bulgaria, Greece, and in Yugoslavia. And they showed their dissatisfaction and the discontent, their discontent with the new rulers, with the new masters, from the very beginning. First, by supporting the terrorist activities of Imbro, now led by uh, Todor Alexandrov. Uh, and secondly, by supporting overwhelmingly the, in, in the three countries that control Macedonia, by supporting forces on the left that hatred to Macedonian interests and oppose the established status quo as the Macedonian state. And that those were the communist parties. Few brief comments on the two. Now, Vomoro of Todor Alexandrov was no longer the Vomoro Imro or the original Imro, both the Delchev and Dami Imroev and so on. By the 1920s, it had regrouped itself and emerged as a terrorist organization that as time went on, served the interests of Bulgarian revisionism as well as Italian fascism. But officially, and for all practical purposes, it retained the slogans of the original Bomaro or Imro. It emphasized officially and very vocally that the aim of Imro was 
even of the 1920s was struggle for the unification for the liberation of Macedonia and Macedonia for the Macedonia. And as long as Imro, Todor Alexandrov, and later Pancho Mikhailov continued to emphasize that they're struggling for the freedom of Macedonia, for Macedonians' liberation, Macedonia for the Macedonian people, large numbers of Macedonians supported them and followed them. Their decline begins by the late 1920s, and Von Monroe Vancho Mikhailov disappears virtually from the scene by after the military coup d'etat in Sofia in Bulgaria in 1934, then the military government churned its guns against Imbro, and Imbro was virtually decimated. But there was a tremendous weakness. They, as I said, they emphasized the slogans of the original Imbro, but in the end, they lost most of their support to other Macedonian forces on the left, mainly because Imro, Todor Alexandrov, and especially of Vancho Mikhailov, really never developed a rational program of any kind that would answer the population's national, social, political, economic aims. That is, by the late 1920s, pure and simple, it was a terrorist organization serving its own ends and most of the population became disillusioned with it. But the fact that the population supported them throughout the 1920s was a clear indication that the population in the three parts of Macedonia rejected <coughs> the new masters and the system that had been established there. Secondly, the link with the communists. Virtually from the very beginning, there is from the original establishment of the Communist parties in the Balkans, the Communist Party of Bulgaria, Serbia, uh, Yugoslavia, and Greece. The Communist parties realized the revolutionary potential in the Macedonian discontent, and they began to court the Macedonians. The Communist Party, early in the 1920s, all three Communist parties recognized the existence of a Macedonian political nation, and by the mid-1920s, they came out with a program that called for the unification of Macedonia and then the inclusion of Macedonia as an equal partner in the Balkan Communist Federation. <laughs> Whether they meant it or not is irrelevant. But they realized, as I said, the revolutionary potential in Macedonia and in effect they were telling the Macedonian people what the Macedonian people wanted to hear in order to bring them to their side. And in the first and the only free election held in the, Balk in the three Balkan countries in the 1920s, most, the, the largest or the, the, the most decisive support uh, that went to the communist parties of Yugoslavia, Greece, and Bulgaria came from Macedonia. Now, this was not because the Macedonian peasants were Marxists or they understood Marxism or Marxism-Leninism. It was mainly because the communist parties were the only ones that were sympathetic to their aims and came to their support. And already in the 1920s, a sort of an alliance is being formed between Macedonian nationalism and international communism. Both are using each other for their own purposes. But in the end, it benefited this marriage of convenience, as I call it, benefited both sides. In the 19, in uh, early 1924, uh, International, the Communist International, the Communist International, who, as I have said, realized the revolutionary potential of Macedonia and of Macedonian nationalism, attempted to bring together the left and the right wing of the Macedonian revolutionary movement. That is to bring the Imro of Todor Alexandrov to unite it together with various left-wing Macedonian revolutionary organizations, and then to include this united Macedonian revolutionary movement within the Communist International. An agreement was reached, but in the end, it, it, in the last minute, it was rejected by Todor Alexandrov or the right wing of Imro. And the rejection uh, of this unification agreement in 1924 split finally the internal Macedonian revolutionary organization. As I have emphasized, 
this organization was divided from its very beginning between left and right. But after the failure of the unification agreement of 1924, the split becomes final. The right, after the assassination of Fedor Alexandrov, passes under the leadership or to the leadership of Ivan or Vancho Mikhailov. And as I've said, it evolved or developed into a terrorist organization that served foreign interests much more than it served Macedonian interests. The left named itself IMRO United, or Internal Macedonian Revolutionary Organization United, was accepted or admitted into the Comintern, the Communist International, uh, and was accepted by the Balkan Communist Party. And from 1924-26 until its dissolution in 1936, it really played the role of a Macedonian popular or national front. Now, I'm emphasizing the Macedonian, the, the, the communist connection here, even though both sides were really using each other. Because it represents a tremendous transformation uh, for the Macedon or for Macedonian nationalism. Once Vomoro Imro United was admitted into the United into the Communist International, the Comintern, the Comintern officially recognized the existence of a Macedonian nation. And the Communist parties of the Balkans did the same thing. By the late 1920s, early 30s, they all recognized that the Macedonians are neither Bulgarians nor Serbs nor Greeks, that they constitute a separate South Slavic nation with its own Macedonian language, Macedonian culture, Macedonian history, and with the right to exist on its own, with the right to self-determination. And they continued that after the communist revolution or socialist revolution, Macedonia would become an equal partner in some kind of socialist or communist federation. That was the official program of the Communist International and the Communist parties of the Balkans. And they attracted large following among the Macedonians. Again, to repeat, not because the Macedonians were such good Marxists, hardly any of the peasants understood Marxism, but because the communists came out with a program that served Macedonian interests. While all the other political parties in Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, and Greece denied the existence of Macedonia, the communist parties were the only ones to recognize not only their existence, but also their right to national self-determination. Whether the communist parties would have implemented this program, eventually or not, that's a different story. But the fact remains that the communist parties and the communist international and IMRO, Vomero United, as a result of this policy, they really acquired mass support in Macedonia. They drew to their side large numbers from the right wing of IMRO, which did not possess a national program of any kind. And then the Internal Macedonian Revolutionary Organization United organized all kinds of Macedonian organizations, cultural, literary societies, student groups, sports societies, and so on, in all three parts of Macedonia, but especially in Pirin and Barber Macedonia. And it was in this organization, now sponsored by intern the Internal Macedonian Revolutionary Organization United, by the left wing of the Macedonian Revolutionary Organization, that a new generation of a Macedonian intelligence developed. And it was within the context of these organizations and under the auspices of IMRO United that the three tendencies from the 19th century the Macedonian Bulgarianism and Macedonianism of the intelligentsia and the Nazism of the masses coalesced into a Macedonian nationalism on the left. A Macedonian, and, and it was this new generation of the Macedonian intelligentsia that established or, the grounds for the development of the Macedonian literary language, for the development of a Macedonian culture, and uh, and so on. And most importantly, it was within this new context on the left that 
the Macedonia, this new Macedonian nationalism on the left, came out with a political program of its own, which called for the national unification and national liberation of Macedonia. In this, uh, they accepted the communist program that called for Macedonian liberation and unification and eventual inclusion in a Balkan communist federation. But there was a major difference between the communist and the Macedonian nationalists, even if they were communists. The communist international and the communist parties in the Balkans emphasized that there should be a revolution and a Balkan communist federation first, and then United Macedonia second within that Balkan federation. The Macedonians turned the program around. The Macedonians were in effect calling first and foremost for the liberation and unification of Macedonia, and then the inclusion of this liberated and united Macedonia in some kind of a Balkan federation. This was a fundamental difference between the two, and in the end it proved tragic for Macedonian nationalism. Because to me it showed that the communist parties were trying to use the Macedonians for their own purposes, promising unification and liberation but in the distant future, after a communist revolution had taken place and after a communist uh, socialist Balkan federation had been established. The Macedonians <coughs> realized what was involved, that really neither one nor the other, nor the third of the communist parties of the Balkans were prepared to fight with their Macedonian territory. And that's why they emphasized national unification and liberation first, and Communist Federation second. But it was, and I'm coming to the end, it was with aims such as this, national liberation, national unification, that large numbers of Macedonian <coughs> communists and bourgeois nationalists, if you will, joined the communist-led resistance movements in Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, and Greece during the Second World War. That is, the expectation was that once the communist side win, or the resistance movements establish themselves in power, the Macedonian aims would be achieved. But long before the Second World War ended, Macedonia and the Macedonians again became the apple of discord in the Balkans, this time dividing the communist parties of the Balkans. Before the war was over, the communist parties of the three Balkan states that controlled the three parts of Macedonia were locked in a vicious struggle for control of Macedonia. And this struggle continued after the end of the Second World War during the negotiations between Tito and Dimitrov for a Bulgarian Yugoslav Federation through the civil war in Greece and into the Soviet Yugoslav split. And as a result of this struggle between or among the communist parties in the Balkans and the international complications that ensued, the Macedonians did not achieve national unification and they achieved national emancipation only in one, in the Yugoslav part of Macedonia. And it is that part of Macedonia that 50 years later, after the dissolution of Yugoslavia, declared itself the Republic of Macedonia and has, in effect, become the first independent Macedonian state in modern times. In conclusion, in conclusion, just very briefly, as I've emphasized throughout the discussion, uh, the neighboring Balkan nationalism, who claimed Macedonia and the Macedonians for themselves, denied the existence of a Macedonian people, a <coughs> Macedonian nation. And in effect, they have consistently argued that the Macedonian question was, respectively, for the Bulgarians, a Bulgarian question, for the Greeks, a Greek question, for the Serbians, a Serbian question. They have also argued, uh, when they were in a more liberal mood, 
that if there is such a thing as a Macedonian nation and a Macedonian language, that Macedonian language and nation was artificially created by Tito during the Second World War. Yeah. As I tried to emphasize throughout this survey of Macedonian nationalism, the Macedonian question throughout its history was primarily a Macedonian question because it concerned the fate and the interests of the Macedonian people. And secondly, and more importantly, that Macedonian, the Macedonian nation was not created artificially by anybody, Tito or any other special interest. The Macedonian nation was created by the Macedonians or formed, was formed by the Macedonian people in a prolonged, difficult, but in the end successful struggle for national development and national existence. Thank you. nation-forming process 
nation building process and so on with the period after the Enlightenment. That's why I make my remarks at the beginning. Enlightenment, the French Revolution, and so on. Now, you have peoples before, but I don't think you can talk of nations. Uh, and this applies not only to Macedonians, but to everybody else. You can talk of a Bulgarian, or a Serbian, or a Greek, or a Czech, or whatever people before. But it would be very difficult to talk of a Greek, Bulgarian, Serbian nation before the period of national, before the national awakening of the late 18th, early 19th century. Now, I really, I, 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 there is a school of historiography which is completely passé or unacceptable in the West, but has continued in the Balkans, romantic nationalism. Uh, but that, as I said, in the West is, uh, you know, it's, a, it, it's being studied as a historical phenomenon. Um, and romantic nationalism, in effect, argues that national consciousness, unlike bourgeois historiography, that national consciousness is not an acquired thing, but rather that nationalism runs in one's veins, blood, whatever, which is kind of rather racist. Now, uh, it would, uh, I obviously do not subscribe to that theory. I don't think nationalism runs in anybody's blood or veins, because nationalism is basically acquired. Um, because whenever, and I've gone on many research trips in the Balkans to Bulgaria, Serbia, and Greece, and I was claimed by everybody. I remember I was waiting for a visa in the Bulgarian embassy, in, 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 uh, or I went for a visa to the Bulgarian embassy in Belgrade, you know, to go to Sofia to do some research in the archives, and um, I went there with the cultural attaché from the Canadian embassy. Uh, and nobody, it was on the weekend, nobody, the three people who were in the embassy didn't speak either French or English. So I was kind of, I would have preferred to avoid speaking Macedonian or Bulgarian or whatever, but I was forced into it. I decided to speak strictly village, Selsky Makedonsky, the dialect. <laughs> and he immediately turned to me and he says, oh, he says, you're Bulgarian. And I said, well, I need a help. So I had to get research. I said, you know, I'm Canadian. And he says, but, uh, you know, you speak Bulgarian. And I said, well, I'm Selsky Makedonsky, I said. Oh, he says, so where does your family come from? And I said, the posters from so on. And John said, oh, he says, the best Bulgarians came from there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that wasn't the best. The best one came after that. He said, then he looks at me and he says, he said, Bulgarstinata runs in our blood. <laughs> Bulgarianness runs in our blood, no matter where you come from. And it's imagine Bulgarian, you know, in Greece you hear the same thing, in Serbia you hear the same thing. Now, if you accept romantic nationalism, you see, which as I said, in the West is outdated, then obviously you carry on, you say, well, uh, nations, the Bulgarian, Serbian, Greek, Macedonian, whatever, go way back, I don't know, when. But basically, you see, nationalism in the modern, is the way we understand it now, is a phenomenon of the capitalist states of development. The states that existed before in the Balkans, for example, were not national states. The Byzantine Empire was not a Greek state. The Byzantine emperors wanted to control as large a territory as possible, and they didn't care what language the peasants spoke. They didn't care whether the peasants were Serbian or Greek or Macedonian or Bulgarian or, or whatever. Here we are dealing not with national states, but with the dynastic empire. They were called a certain name because the dynasty called itself. The population didn't use those names. The people were known by their social status. They were their serfs or whatever. And, and to the emperor, to the ruling elite, it didn't make any difference whether the serf was, was Bulgarian or Serbian. The Bulgarian Empire was the same thing. The Serbian Empire, the same thing. And this is what creates the problem of Macedonia. This is my last comment. See that at one time or another in the Middle Ages, the Byzantine Empire, Bulgarian Empire, the Serbian Empire ruled Macedonia or parts of Macedonia. And then in modern times, they point to that period and say, aha, Macedonia belongs to us, Macedonians are Bulgarians. But the Macedonians cannot be all three at the same time. 
and this is the weakness of their arguments, they could never reconcile the contradiction. How can the same people, speaking the same dialect, eating the same food, singing the same folk song, how can they be at the same time Greeks, Bulgarians, and Serbs? Was, was Alexander Slavic or was he was Hellenic? He was not. I know I'm going to Alexander. Somehow you're all infatuated or obsessed with Alexander. To me, he's irrelevant. He had to me, he's irrelevant. Yeah, but, but how can we defend ourselves when the Greeks, they come and say, the Greeks, they are the, you know, uh, the descendants of Alexander uh, the Great. But well, they are wrong also. Yeah, but they, they start with that and everybody believes them. How we can defend ourselves for that? Well, we can always, the only way in history, the only lasting defense is with the truth. Yeah, you see, once people begin... Know from history, you know, when Alexander the Great died... I didn't pick up on Alexander. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, see, I didn't even mention Alexander, Alexander, Alexander in my lecture. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Alexander, this is the last thing. 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 This is the last thing I say on Alexander ancient Macedonians. Ancient Macedonians were neither Greek nor Slav. The Greeks considered them a barbarian people that spoke a barbarian language that the Greeks did not understand. But obviously it's true that the ruling elite, the educated elite of ancient Macedonia, had accepted the Greek culture. The majority of the ancient Macedonians spoke a language that we don't know. It disappeared. It's lost. We don't know what that language is. <coughs> we only know that the Greeks didn't understand it either. Okay? Uh, now, to whom does Alexander Russian Macedonia belong? My answer would be, what difference does it make? But if you want to claim it, well, Macedonians can claim it territorially. And also in terms of, I don't know, there is some kind of blood connection, I suppose. Because when the Slavs came into the peninsula, they assimilated whatever the remains of the people of ancient Macedonia if they had not been assimilated by all kinds of other invasions that preceded the coming of the Slavs. So there is a Macedonian connection. I'll be mentioning the very near You see, there is a Greek connection. And I suppose anybody whose lands Alexander the Great conquered could claim it all the way to India. But I'm not certain that it would serve any useful purpose. I don't know why. Wherever I turn a Macedonian program up, it's always Alexander. Why waste so much time on Alexander? He belongs to everybody. He belongs to the world, and the world claims it. There are 30 cities that you name after him. See, I mentioned that the first phase of the first stage was a Slavic phase. Uh, that is, the Macedonians, before they started identifying as Macedonians, they identified as Slavs. Now, uh, Pan-Slavism is a body of theories. You know, you have Russian Pan-Slavism, you have Serbian Pan-Slavism, and you have uh, Czech Pan-Slavism, and, and so on. Um, See, and Pan-Slavism in some ways, and again, this is, this is my own interpretation, I don't think you'll read it anywhere else, let's say. Pan-Slavism, or the different versions or expressions of Pan-Slavism, represented confessions of weakness on the part of those Slavs who gave rise to them. That is, Slavic people at one time or another in the 19th century felt weak against more powerful non-Slavic oppressors. And the easier way out of a difficult and unpleasant situation was to call for Slavic unity. The Czechs did it in the form of Austro-Slavism, the Croatians did it in the form of Illyrianism. Um, there was a Serbian pan-Slavism and so on. In the Macedonian case, I, I do not detect a school but there is always this tendency, the Macedonians always thought in terms of the Slavs. Uh, but somehow, and, and even though really they hardly ever derived any benefit from Slavs or from Pan-Slavism, because the Serbs and Bulgarians didn't treat them all that much better than the Greeks, 
some of this Slav allegiance was always there. And always uh, they were thinking in terms of larger units. For example, most important programs, beginning with Imro, original Imro, or even before Imro with Georgi Pulevsky, and then Imro, and then uh, Imro United, was always the idea of a Slavic Federation. Uh, I don't think anybody, I think it would be a good topic for a doctoral dissertation, somebody to go back and see, to kind of analyze all these expressions of Macedonian Slavism, and with it they represent a Macedonian school of Pan-Slavism. Okay. Uh, this is one short question. You mentioned about the division of Macedonia. You did not mention the part which is under Albania, it's a very small part. Um, no, no, there is a small part. It's there. I'm conscious that I couldn't go into every detail. Um, see, but it's, it was not the part that went to Albania. That is the villages or the area on the other side of Lake Kokrit and the other side of my part of the Gia Macedonia, that's over Vrnik and Pilishta and Korcha and so on. You see, that was assigned to Bulgaria uh, after the First World War, when the boundaries of Bulgaria were established separately from the Bucharest uh, Accord, which formalized the partition of Macedonia at the end of the Bal Balkan Wars. That's the only reason why I meant, did mention it. But there are, for example, there is a small Macedonian populated territory also in Kosovo, on the other side of Kostivar, or on the other side of the mountains, Sarplanina. There were 30 or 40 Macedonian villages that spoke, that were, that best Macedonian spoke. They're Muslim Macedonian, and they speak Macedonian that doesn't have any Serbism, Bulgarianism, Grecism, or Turkism. I was there, and then there is the best, the, 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 the cleanest Macedonian speech I've ever heard. Goran. Yeah. 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 In Albania. In Albania. No, this is in Kosovo. <coughs> in Serbia, so the Albanian populated province of Serbia, to the north. Uh, in, in, in Albania, they speak more or less the same kind of dialects as we speak in Kostos and They're very similar. And just one more thing, I'd like to ask. Since we did uh, mention Kosovo, one looks at the New York Times uh, that there was talk about drawing a line, the Clinton administration of the West drawing a line in the sand over Kosovo and Macedonia. And I, I was wondering, uh, briefly, in order to save your voice and everything, if you would care to just uh, give a brief summary, what now? Let's cut to the chase away from Alexander. Uh, what now is, is uh, happening? Is, is, is Macedonia in peril or more in peril now? What exactly is happening? No, when it comes to Macedonia, we're always optimistic. <laughs> uh, if you lose your optimism, then we have nothing. Oh, I'm optimistic, but I'm just... No, uh, basically, no, no, basically, I'm kind of optimistic. I think, um, you know, predicting what happens in the back of Balkans is always risky. But at least on the basis of whatever evidence there is, and I've been involved in these things for the last three years, I think now the Republic is safer than it was two years ago. Um, two years ago, there was no international recognition of boundaries or anything else. But also, and this is the point that you made, uh, it's not just Clinton. Um, is that with the fall of communism, you think, though? So? you saying, you think that because of the fall of communism the last couple of years, that there's such a resurgence? Well, no, no, that, that, that has a great deal to do. I think it begins already with Tito's death and even earlier. But obviously the fall of communism and the collapse of Yugoslavia has a great deal to do with it. But more specifically to the question that was raised here, you see, what has happened in the last, before Clinton came, assumed uh, the presidency, already with Bush's administration, the American State Department, NATO, and the European community already in September, October, made it clear to Serbia that if uh, trouble erupts in Kosovo, that trouble might spill into Macedonia, and that would mean a general Balkan war, which would involve even Greece and Turkey, two NATO allies, 
Uh, so they made it clear, all of them, to Serbia that they, if this trouble erupts in Kosovo and spills into Macedonia, then there'll be foreign intervention. They made it clear to Serbia, and I think Milosevic and the others took it seriously. So I really, that's one thing. The other thing is, as long as Serbia is involved in the north, I don't think Serbia has, has the resources to fight another war in the south. So that's, that's a second uh, consideration that seems to favor <coughs> Macedonia. And now with international recognition, it would be more difficult. Uh, the, the, the greatest danger that Macedonia faces now, actually, really not from Serbia directly, not from Greece. I don't think Greece wants any more slots in Greece in any case. Uh, the greatest problem would be if there is trouble in Kosovo if it erupts kind of independently what Serbia does, that it is the Albanians who rebel against the Serbs, and Serbia sends a huge army to Kosovo and tries to push hundreds of thousands of Albanians from Kosovo into Macedonia, see, then you have a problem. You see, or if Macedonian Albanians go to help their Albanian friends in Kosovo, and then Serbia might use that as a pretext even to intervene against Macedonia. So I don't think, I'm not, I'm not afraid or that I don't foresee a direct intervention on anybody's part against Macedonia. But Kosovo, trouble in Kosovo could complicate things for Macedonia. Otherwise, the Republic, you know, has done pretty well for itself. So far.